I'm gonna ride, I'm riding free. So come on, let's go along, come on, let's journey with me. I'm gonna ride, I'm riding free. As long as I am here with you, I feel the spirit with me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm breathing in.
A very good evening to all. A warm welcome extends to our guest speakers, Dr. Mia Bobil, Ms. Sachitra Virasuria, and all the participants. The Astronomical Society of Hillwood College has organized today's virtual event as another step to inspire young astronomy enthusiasts. Something we always believe is that though this COVID-19 pandemic is a very difficult time for all of us, there are slight incidences like this where we are gaining something valuable from our time spent in the virtual environment. Women in Astronomy is a live session organized by a society in hope of inspiring young girls to strive to do great things in future. Today's distinguished guest speakers will tell an unheard story about a group of women known as the Harvard Computers, whose voices weren't heard even though they mapped the universe. So, without further ado, I would like to invite Dasani Hera to introduce our guest speakers. Thank you. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce our guest speaker today, Dr. Mia Bowie. Dr. Mia Burwell is an assistant professor of astronomy at Texas Christian University. She earned her Bachelor of Science in 2004 on physics and astronomy at University of Maryland and her Master of Science in 2006, her PhD in 2011 in astronomy at University of Maryland. Her astronomy PhD research topic was on simulations of fossils of the first galaxies in the local group. She also received a fellowship at Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile, where she expanded her study of dwarf galaxies. Dr. Mia Bowell worked at the detectability of the first stars with James Webb Space Telescope. Now I would like to invite Dr. Mia Bowell to conduct the session about the Harvard computers. All right, can everyone see my screen? Yes, ma'am. All right, thank you so much um, for having me. Um, I'm going, this is a story of a group of women who worked at Harvard over the course of about 50 years. And there are, if you are interested in reading more about these women, um, The Glass Universe by Davis Sobel and The Madame Curie Complex by Julia Desjardins is, are both phenomenal references. And The Madame Curie Complex tells the story not only of the Harvard computers, but of many women in science. So before I can talk about the Harvard computers, I need to tell you a bit about the science and actually why the work they're doing is so spectacular. This is an image of Omega Centauri. It is a globular, the largest of the globular clusters that orbits our Milky Way. And globular clusters are very simply star clusters that look almost exactly like this. They are extremely dense. They have between 100,000 or a million stars and they orbit the disk of our galaxy in a spherical, distribute in a spherical distribution and we have about 150 of them. The Hubble Space Telescope took an image of just the center region of Omega Centauri and this is that image that were in this case they took it in multiple filters the stars and the stars that are now the stars that are blue don't look quite that blue but they are blue the stars that are red may not look exactly that red to your eye but they are red and we're gonna start this by reorganizing these stars a little bit. This is a Hubble space. Just a second, let me see. And I, there is a talk over the animation. Telescope image of the crowded core of the globular cluster Omega Centauri. The brilliant colors of the stars are real. They correspond to stellar temperatures. They can also be used to trace stellar evolution. Astronomers like to know how blue the blue stars are and how red the red stars are. So we'll first sort these stars out by color, blue on the left and red on the right. 
Next, we'll sort the stars according to brightness. The brightest stars at the top and the faint stars at the bottom. The final plot you see represents different stages of evolution of stars. Stars spend most of their lifetime burning on the main sequence. When their fuel starts to run out, they expand to become red giants. They find a new source of fuel, helium, and burn blue hot, but even that runs out. They end up burning out as white dwarfs. This, what you're seeing here, is something called the Hertz van Russell diagram. It is quite simply one of the most important plots in all of astronomy. Encoded on this is the main sequence, is the evolution of stars as they come off of that main sequence. To give you a sense, our sun would be about here. In addition, you have the, you also have information on here about the age of star clusters and information for the information on the masses of stars and even on the distances. But the question of how do we and why do we understand this diagram is the story scientifically that I'm going to be telling you today while also talking about the Harvard computers. This is a Hubble's. So this is sort of a more cartoon version of this. So on the horizontal axis is temperature. And temperature, instead of increasing like it normally would to the right, actually increases to the left on this diagram. Luminosity, or the amount of energy a star produces per second, increases vertically. Our sun is right here. Here is the main sequence where stars are born. They live on the main sequence the majority of their lives, and then they evolve off. But note the bottom axis here, the surface temperatures, and these series of letters called in astronomy the spectral classifications. And so begins our story. One of the interesting things in astronomy is that every single time there is a new kind of technology that we use, we actually, we tend to grab it and we tend to use it. And the, this technology in about 1860 was photographic plates. And, I, and when you picture these, this isn't just like, well, this isn't just like a photograph. These are actual glass plates. And they were put at the base of a telescope and then were exposed to the light coming through the telescope. This was revolutionary because before this, you could only manage to keep, think about how long, think for a second about how long you can keep your eye open. The longest you can probably keep your eye open without blinking is maybe 30 seconds, maybe a minute if you really, really push it but a photographic plate could be exposed for literally hours. It could be exposed all night, which meant that we were able to see far fainter things than we could with our naked eye. I'd like to introduce you to the first character in our story. His name is Henry Draper. And he, and he figured out a way to determine even more information of stars on these photographic plates. And that was by breaking the light up into a spectrum. The image here is a spectrum of our sun. And the patterns of these spectral lines actually tell us, like just like fingerprints, what elements are in the sun. So this is the specific pattern for hydrogen. You can also see the patterns for helium, carbon, as well as some other elements in the spectrum of the sun. And what Henry Draper did is he put a spectrograph. He put something that can break that light into, into its spectrum on the end of the telescope and then put a photographic plate on it. And this is what it produces. So instead of the individual stars that you saw here, each of these stars we now have a spectrum of. And when we have a spectrum of them, we can tell what their temperature was and what they're made out of. And so this was this was brand new, absolutely cutting edge technology. I like to say that this is the original big data problem in astronomy as this, as this starts. Now, Henry Draper was married to Anna Draper and her family owned some property in New York and actually was the one, was the person in the marriage who had the money. And that is actually gonna be important in a second because Henry Draper goes out and takes a walk and catches and gets soaked and catches a bit of a chill and dies a week later. 
And Anna Draper was completely, utterly heartbroken and wanted to ensure that her husband's work of building a stellar catalog continued after his death. And so remember, she had money from her family. She goes to Edward Pickering, this gentleman who was the director of Harvard Observatory at the time, and says to him, I'm gonna give you money if you finish what my husband started and put his name on the catalog. And this is still true in astronomy today. If somebody gives you money to do something, you say, sure, I can put your dead husband's name on the catalog. Thank you very much. And Pickering, I want, it's important, I think, to put Pickering in context. By modern standards, he does not meet our expectations for gender equality. But by the standards in 1880, he was probably 40 to 50 years ahead of his time. And this is a quote by him. The criticism is often made by the opponents of the higher education of women, that while they are capable of following others as far as men can, they originate almost nothing so that human knowledge is not advanced by their work. This reproach would be well answered could we point to a long series of such observations as are detailed below made by women observers. Very critically, he allowed the women of the Harvard Observatory to own their own work, to put their names on their own work. And that becomes a, that is why our story can actually be told. These are the women of the Harvard Observatory, likely circa about 1910. This is Annie Jump Cannon, who we're going to be talking about. And I think Henrietta Leavitt is here. So the first character in our story is Wilhelmina Fleming. And Wilhelmina Fleming was Scottish. She immigrated, she, now she was had a high school, she actually finished high school, which for a woman again in 1880, this was a big deal to get through high school. And she immigrates to the U.S. with her husband in 19, in, in immigrates to the U.S. with her husband, who promptly leaves her alone in Boston pregnant. And she needs to find a job to support herself. So she gets a job working as a maid in the observatory, in the observatory director's house, because they live, the, the Pickering lived on site. And she goes and gets a job as a maid. And the apocryphal story, which probably didn't happen, is that Pickering was quite upset with the work that the men were doing. They were very expensive and they weren't moving as quickly as he wanted to with the catalog. And he apocryphally says that my maid could do better. What likely happened is that his wife noticed that Wilhelmina Fleming was, educate, was far too educated and intelligent to be a maid and to had him transfer her over to the observatory. But either way, Wilhelmina Fleming becomes one of the first Harvard computers. And she was given a lot of tasks, find Nova, classify variable stars. But, one, but for the purposes of our story of the Hertz Fen Russell diagram, her main task was given to classify the spectral lines, try to put the stars into category by their spectral lines. And because hydrogen seemed to be the strongest set of lines of any of the spectra, she classified the stars by hydrogen. The stars with the strongest lines she called A. The stars with the next strongest lines, B, and then C, and then D, write down the alphabet. She was also in charge of the entire Henry Draper catalog. So she was actually in charge of publishing volumes like this that had all of the data on the stars and on the spectra at Harvard. And this is the room at the observatory and that is Wilhelmina Fleming working. What you can see here is that she is on a frame and the glass plate is in that frame. And then they would look over the frame with a magnifying glass to do the classifications. And she she did she eventually became the curator of plates at Harvard. This is actually a title that still exists to this day, and many of the amazing images I got from the current curator of plates. But Pickering seems to think that no work is too much or too hard for me, no matter what the responsibility or how the long the hours. But let me raise the question of salary, and I am immediately told that I receive an excellent salary as women's salaries go. One of the reasons that Pickering was using women is he could pay them approximately half what he was paying the men. The next character in our story is Antonio Mar Antonio Mari. 
And so he, this is an image of what we call a grism spectrograph, where you just stick a spectrograph and you get a spectrum of every single star on the image. However, they eventually began taking spectra of single stars. And I want you to quickly compare the level of detail that you can see in these spectra, where this is a single spectra of just one star, and the level of detail you can see here, where it's, you have the spectra of many stars. And Antonio Mari noted not only the strengths of the spectral lines, but also their shape. And when she noticed this, she tried to come up with a classification scheme that would incorporate all of them. And how, where, how she got there and what that actually ended up being is something that I'm gonna to talk to you about at the end. She worked intermittently at Harvard, sort of going back between the Harvard Observatory and her family. And then we have Henrietta Swan Leavitt. Henrietta had a, has a, had a degree from Radcliffe College, which was basically the women's college of what is now Harvard University. So today she would have a degree, a bachelor's from Harvard University. She was also profoundly deaf. She wore, if she needed to speak, she wore a hearing aid. If she needed to hear, rather, she wore a hearing aid. And she was given a very simple task. Classify the variable stars, classify variable stars. Literally, that was it. Classify variable stars. And that is as, you know, as someone who has both done a thesis and is now advising students through a thesis, you don't simply tell someone to classify variable stars. You're usually trying to get at something, but she was just said to classify the variables. And right around the time she starts doing this, they get information, they get data on the small Magellanic cloud, which is one of two satellite galaxies orbiting, um, orbiting our Milky Way. I don't know if you're further far enough south there in Sri Lanka to actually see these. They're visible from the Southern Hemisphere. So this is a nice, pretty image of the small Magellanic cloud. This is the actual image from the photographic plate. The notations on this are her notations. These are her notations of the small Magellanic cloud. And what's incredibly important is that she noted a class of variable stars. So these are noting the locations of all the variable stars in the Magellanic cloud. And just to really drive home that these were glass plates, glass plates. If you can see here, that's a crack. That's an actual crack in the glass plate. It, at some point, somebody hit it or it broke a little bit and the plate cracked. So these are incredibly fragile that they were dealing with. But here's the incredible thing. All of the stars in the Magellanic cloud are at the same distance. And because they're roughly at the same distance, we know that if you take one, two stars in the Magellanic cloud and this star is significantly brighter and then this star, we know that this star actually is brighter. We only can do this because they're all at the same distance. And she notes something. She sees the period between the peaks of how long does it take a star to go from its brightest point to the next brightest point. So the period of the variation. And she plots it up and she looks at the period in days versus the brightness of the star. And remember, she can do this because everything's at the same distance in the Magellanic Cloud. And she finds that for a category of stars called the Cepheid, that has a very distinctive light curve where it rises and then falls, that there is a very tight linear relationship between the period of the Cepheid and its absolute brightness or its luminosity. This here is this was called the period luminosity relationship, and it is one of the most important thing, relationships in all of astronomy. This is Henrietta Leavitt with Annie Jump Cannon. Um, they were friends. The women of the observatory were friends. They worked six days a week and socialized on Sunday is what was often said. Annie Jump Cannon owned a house and she rented out rooms to the other computers. So these women knew each other, they, they, they supported each other and it was social as well as professional. Annie Jump Cannon 
was got a bachelor's of science in physics and astronomy from Vassar College and she was a valedictorian. She was the top student at Vassar in her year. Today, she would be going on to one of the best graduate programs in the world. Instead, she finishes her degree and goes home. She and Henrietta Leavitt had actually met when they'd worked at Harvard when they were both in undergrads, but Edward Pickering had a policy that he didn't allow anyone to come to Harvard unless he could pay them. And they basically had to wait until a computer either retired or got married, because when these women got married, they stopped working at Harvard Observatory and there would be a position opened up for them to come and actually work on the glass plates. Annie Jump Cannon was, event, well, during her travels in between undergrad and when she's actually able to go to Harvard, contracts scarlet fever and actually was also deaf. Though unlike Henrietta Leavitt, she actually wore her hearing aid quite a bit. She would attend plays and attend concerts. And she takes on the task of once again, looking at the spectra of the stars. Now remember, Wilhelmina Fleming had a high school education. She didn't have a bachelor's of science in astronomy. And so Annie Jump Cannon tries to say, okay, let's take a look at these spectra again. And let's see if we can classify these spectra, reclassify these spectra. And she keeps the ABC. So remember Wilhelmina Fleming, this is, does the strongest hydrogen lines are A, then B, then C down the line. So A has the strongest hydrogen lines, O has the weakest. And Annie Jump Cannon reorders the lines and cleans it up a little bit, gets rid of some superfluous letters and categories and reorganizes them. So B moves from here to here. So it turns out that O stars are actually hotter than B stars. And when you reorder them and clean them up, you get O, B, A, F, G, K, M, which is not the easiest sequence of letters to remember. So Annie Jump Cannon comes up with a mnemonic. O, B, A, fine, got, O, B, A, fine, girl, kiss me. That, for the record, is still the mnemonic that we are using today. Every single time I teach this class or I introduce this, I always say, if you can come up with a better mnemonic, please do. So now we have our spectral sequence from the hottest O stars down to the coolest and dimmest of the M stars. But why? But here's a question to sort of put. Why are the, do the hottest stars have the weakest hydrogen lines? Why does there seem to be a point after which the hydrogen lines almost disappear from the spectra in these extremely hot stars. And to answer that question, we have to introduce the next person in our story. But I think Annie should speak. This is from a letter she wrote to her sister in 1912 at a meeting that was the precursor to what is now the International Astronomical Union. I was very much surprised to find that I was put on the Committee on the Classification of Stellar Spectra. And one of the novel experiences of the summer was to meet with this committee. They sat at the long table, these men of many nations, and I was the only woman. Since I have done almost all of the world's work in this one branch, it was necessary for me to do most of the talking. She was at this point, the world expert on classifying stellar spectra. She could look at a stellar spectra and classify it in about 15 seconds at, by this point. And so introducing the final character in our story, Cecilia Payne, eventually Cecilia Payne Gapochkin. Cecilia Payne was British and she reads physics at Cambridge, reads or studies physics at Cambridge. And I want you to note that I, I'm not saying that she had a degree from Cambridge because in 1923, Cambridge did not grant degrees to women. So she learned everything that the men learned, but she doesn't actually, she didn't, wasn't actually granted the degree. And while she's at Cambridge in sort of the 1920s, there's this new thing that's being developed largely in Europe called quantum mechanics, which is this literal giant leap forward in our understanding of how atoms work and how we model atoms and talk about atoms. 
So she's exposed to this brand new thing called quantum mechanics while she's reading physics in Cambridge. In 1910, 13 years earlier, Edward Pickering had died. Howard Shapley became the new director of the observatory and they established a fellowship called the Pickering Fellowship in honor of Pickering's work with the Harvard computers. Pickering then, Pickering then basically then, so Cecilia Payne is granted the second Pickering Fellowship. And these weren't just fellowships to bring you to Harvard and work on the plates. These are actually fellowships to have you come to Harvard and get a master's degree in astronomy. So this wasn't just to come and work as a computer. You did work with the computers, but you were actually there to get a degree. And Cecilia Payne takes them up on it. And in 1923, goes to Cambridge. And she, I followed Milan's advice and set out to make quantitative, the qualitative information that was inherent in the Henry Draper system. And in order to do this, she needed this new science of quantum mechanics. And this is roughly how this works. This is Niels Bohr. He was, uh, he was a theoretical physicist working out of Copenhagen. He actually ended up in the United States during World War II and then eventually returned to Copenhagen. And he developed a very simple model of the atom where the nucleus here is surrounded by orbitals on which the electrons move. Now, the critical thing here is the electrons can only move between the orbitals, which is why you have these very discrete spectral lines. But how do you relate the or this model to the spectral lines you see in an actual star? And for that, you need Saha. And Saha figures out the equations that relate Bohr's, the model of Bohr's atom and the movement of the electrons to the actual generation of the spectral lines. And he did his work large in almost entirely in New Delhi. And actually after partition in India served in the first Indian parliament. So very, so really, really, really interesting guy. Now this is not meant to scare you. These are the Saha equations. These are the equations that govern spectral lines. And I to, I'm showing these to you to really drive home that Cecilia Payne didn't have a calculator. She didn't have a computer. Today, when we learn these, we actually use computer programs just to, to do them. She was doing this on, a, on what's called a slide rule. So she's taking these equations and the, applying them to the spectra from, the, from Harvard, this, this 500,000 plate archive of 500,000 plate um, archive that has all of these spectra on it. And the first thing she figures out is why the O stars have such faint spectral, such faint hydrogen lines. And the reason is they are so hot that the electron is stripped off of the hydrogen atom, completely ionizing it. And when hydrogen is ionized, you have absolutely no, you can't have a spectral line if you have ionized hydrogen. And so that's why O stars have such weak lines. The hottest stars have the weakest lines because they're ionized. And then as the stars begin to cool down, the hydrogen becomes less ionized, but it's why the strongest hydrogen lines are in stars that are a little under, at the surface temperature, a little under 10,000 Kelvin, which is roughly 10,000 Celsius. So what Cecilia Payne adds is these numbers that you see below. The knowledge that an M star is 3000 and why the spectral lines behave the way they do. Now, this alone was a spectacular result. This alone would have gotten her a PhD in astronomy and ensured her place in history, but she wasn't done yet. So remember that I told you that the strength of the lines, there's a strength to the lines and the stronger the line, you now know what the stronger the line, the more of that material there is. The hydrogen lines and stars were by far the strongest lines. And so Cecilia Payne once again takes the, the spectra and she takes the knowledge from Bohr and from Saha and says, okay, let's try to figure out what the abundances of the elements in these stars are. Up until this point, it was assumed that the sun really had the same composition of the earth. So iron, silicon, et cetera. 
This, I'm guessing all of you have seen this, this is the periodic table. And what Cecilia Payne determines is that it turns out that that's not the case. When you look at the compositions of stars, in fact, when you look at the composition of the entire universe, 90% of the atoms are hydrogen, 10% of the atoms are helium, and there were only very small trace amounts of everything else. So astronomers actually say that we have hydrogen and helium and everything else is a metal. I always sort of say, if you're not really a big fan of the periodic table, astronomy is definitively the science for you. But this is literally the answer, not only to why is the spectral sequence the way it is, how does do the spectra relate to the temperatures of the stars, but also what the universe is actually made out of. And as is very typical when you have a result like this, she sent it to a more senior colleague, Henry Norris Russell, who by the way, is the same Russell of the Hertz von Russell diagram. And he writes her back in 1925 and says, it is clearly impossible that hydrogen should be a million times more abundant than metals. Now, four years later, he finds the same result. He does cite pain and he does say, hey, she found this, but he is largely given credit for the discovery. Her PhD thesis, Stellar Atmospheres, a Contribution to the Observational Study of High Temperatures in the reversing layers of stars has been called the most brilliant PhD thesis ever written in astronomy. From 1880 to 1950, more than 200 computers classified stars on half a million glass plates. The work they did forms the backbone of stellar astrophysics. When you take an intro to astronomy class, you learn who Henrietta Leavitt and Annie Jump Cannon and Cecilia Payne are. To date, the current curator of plates is trying to determine all of their names. And to date, she knows about 160 of those names. But remember I told you that Edward Pickering gave the women ownership over their work. When you cite the period luminosity relation, you cite Leave It 1908. There was, another, there was another archive of plates at Mount Wilson Observatory, which is an observatory just outside of Pasadena, California outside of Los Angeles. And the, there were 200,000 glass plates there. So about half the size of the Harvard archive. But, and they also used computers. This is historical fact. They also used women as computers. But because at Mount Wilson, you didn't have someone giving the women ownership over their work, only a few of the names of the women who worked at Mount Wilson are known. And most of those, those names are known because they actually worked at Harvard. Wilhelmina Fleming was the first woman to ever have a title at Harvard, the curator of plates. However, even in astronomy, her contributions have largely been largely forgotten. I think she still holds the record for the most discovery of Nova in all of astronomy. Her son was born in Scotland and eventually joined her in the United States when he was about eight. His, her son's name is Edward Pickering Fleming in recognition for everything Edward Pickering did for her. And Pickering actually helped pay for her son's education. On her tombstone is a single word, astronomer. Antonio Mari would work at the Harvard Observatory on and off for decades. In 1944, she became the second recipient of the Annie Jump Cannon Prize, and she dies in 1952. The complex classification scheme that she was trying to unify with those incredibly detailed spectra is still used today. In fact, it is, the it is what allows us to differentiate between supergiant and dwarf stars. So it actually tells us not only about the spectral type of the star or how luminous they are, but actually how big they are. Annie Jump Cannon dies in 1941, and this is a very good shot that's the magnifying glass, and that is the glass plate. During her lifetime, she classified hundreds of thousands of stars. The OBAFG KM spectral classification system was adopted by the International Astronomical Union in 1922, and her classification scheme and her mnemonic are still in use today. The prize, she takes the money from a prize that she was given and endows 
an award. It is endowed and given annually by the American Astronomical Society to an exemplary woman astronomer based in the United States. In 1934, so this is nine years after she gets her PhD, Cecilia Payne receives the first Annie Jump Cannon Prize. 22 years later, she is finally hired onto Harvard as faculty and becomes the first woman to ever become a full professor at Harvard. Three years later, she was its first depart woman department chair. Henrietta Leavitt, and I have saved the best for last, Henrietta Leavitt dies of cancer in 1921. Five years later, Edwin Hubble uses her period luminosity relation to determine the distance to the Andromeda Nebula. What the period luminosity relation allowed you to do is that if you could measure the period of a Cepheid, which is actually pretty straightforward to do, you could determine the luminosity of a star. And if you know the absolute brightness of a star and you can measure its apparent brightness, you can get the distance to an object. And Cepheids happen to be extremely bright. So we can see them in what we know now are external galaxies. So Edwin Hubble uses the period luminosity relation. He observes Cepheids at the 100 meter telescope at Mount Wilson in the Andromeda Nebula. And he proves that it's not a nebula, but an external galaxy about 2.5 about million light years away from Earth. Three years later, he uses the same period luminosity relation to get the distance to many external galaxies. And that work proves that the universe was expanding. Today, the period luminosity relation forms the absolute backbone of the astronomical distance ladder. This is the means by which astronomers determine the scale and the fate of the universe and our place in it. In November 2008, on the centennial of Henrietta Leavitt's discovery, a symposium celebrating it was held at Harvard. It was recommended that it recommended that hereafter the Cepheid period luminosity relation, which is how I learned it when I learned astronomy, be referred to as the Leave It Law. In 2009, the American Astronomical Society agreed. And the, this is circa 2014. I tried to find an updated picture and I couldn't find one. These are the women of Harvard Observatory in 2014. Every single woman here is an absolute at the absolute top of their field. Every single one of them has a PhD in astronomy as, or astrophysics. These are, this was a conference at the Space Telescope Science Institute, which is the institute in Baltimore, Maryland that runs the Hubble Space Telescope and the just launched James Webb Space Telescope. So these are, every single one of these women is an astronomer who actually is working on stars and the physics of stars and the evolution of stars. I'm trying to see, I think she wasn't in the picture. These are Athena, which is a telescope that, that observes in x-rays. And these are all of the women who are working, all the women scientists working on Athena. The women of Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico. And finally, a colleague of mine from when I was at the Space Telescope Science Institute with a small telescope that she helped build. This is the James Webb Space Telescope, which is currently at L2. Thank you. For serious, if anybody has questions, either about the talk or about um, how you basically become an astronomer.
Dr. Mia, could you explain what did Henry Talivita discover a bit? So what she discovered is this is a relationship between, just a second, let me. So what she discovered is a relationship between, let me go back to it. So she was basically told, I just need to just classify the variables, right? Look at variables, see if they fall into a given category. And she noted that there was a particularly, there was a particular class of variables that, just a second, show. I wanna just pull the, the, um, the image up for you. So she discovered that there was a particular class of variable stars that had this very distinctive light curve. So, and these were named Cepheids because the first star that they were found where this light curve was found was um, in the constellation Cepheus. So that's where the name Cepheid comes from. And because all of the stars were in the small Magellanic cloud, she knew that, the, that if one star was brighter than the other, it wasn't because one star was closer than the other, it was because that star was actually brighter, which she could only do because everything was in this one, they were all at the same distance. Because you can have two stars that have the same actual brightness, and if one's closer, it looks brighter, even though it isn't. Now, what she then, what she then does is she plots up the period, so the amount of time between these two points, versus the brightness of the star. And the reason that this is incredibly important is that this still holds. So what she's, what they then are able to do is some of the closer Cepheids, the Cepheids that are closer to us, they're able to get the distance to them. And that turns this from a relationship of just the stars in the small Magellanic cloud to a relationship of all Cepheids. And so that means that if you go and you observe a Cepheid over you know, a period of let's say a year and you determine the amount of time between these two peaks, so the period in days, and all you need to do for that is have a telescope that you're observing constantly. And then what you do is you just say the period and you go up and you say, okay, we have, that means that it has this luminosity. And if you know the luminosity, you can determine the distance. So one of the easiest things to do in astronomy is actually you look up and you observe how bright does a star appear to be. And if you know how far away, if you know how far away that star is, you can figure out how bright it is, how bright it actually is, the luminosity, the actual energy that it's outputting. However, if you know, but it also goes the other way. If you can somehow figure out the luminosity independently by the period of a Cepheid, you can then figure out how far away that star is. And that becomes, that's what she figures out, is she figures out this first, we call them the standard candles, because you know what the actual luminosity is. But she gives us this yardstick that allows us to, for the first time, determine distances to things outside of the Milky Way and outside of our little area of the Milky Way. And so this is actually literally one of the most important steps of something called the astronomical distance ladder. And the higher you go up the ladder, the further out you go. So without Cepheids, <coughs> this becomes absolutely critical. To me, the greatest tragedy with Henrietta Leavitt is that she died before Edwin Hubble made his observations. So she actually didn't, she lived to see her luminosity, um, period luminosity relation, her work actually be used to determine the distance to the Magellanic clouds, but she didn't live to actually see the Hubble, the fact that galaxies are external, to, that there are external galaxies and that the universe actually, the fact that the universe is actually expanding. So that's what she finds is it's this basically cosmic yardstick. Um, that we now use. That this is this is one of the most important relations. The leave it what's the leave it law is one of the most important relationships in astronomy. And I'm, I have a question in the chat. How can students from countries um, which doesn't which 
don't have astronomy background reach these levels? Um, the answer is you take a lot of physics and you take as much physics as you can and you take as much math as you can to support the physics. If at all possible, you take computer science. A huge amount of what I do is actually on computers. Um, and you just, and you basically build that background. I have an undergraduate degree in astronomy because I went to a large state university in Maryland. I went to my local state university. And because they were a very large school, there were about 35,000 students, they actually had an independent astronomy department. At Texas Christian University, we don't have an independent astronomy department. We actually have a physics and astronomy department, and that is far more common. And when I went to college, I actually, my preparation going into college was not that strong. I had, I had a reasonably strong math preparation, but my physics preparation was lacking to say the least. And the more valuable, I think, of my two undergraduate degrees as I continued on was physics. So as long as you have that grounding in physics and mathematics, and you have some knowledge of computer science, and you can, you're completely fine. And you just read literally everything you can get your hands on. That's, I fell in love with this at 12 years old. There wasn't a course in my school system. There wasn't, you know, anything that I could formally take. I just started reading articles and books and everything that I could possibly find about astronomy specifically while simultaneously taking the math and the computer science and the physics that I was going to need to actually do it. Um, what do I think the Harvard computers would say if they were here today? I think they'd be, I think they'd be proud. I think they'd be shocked. I think they'd be, I, th I think they might be a little disheartened that their work is forgotten, that some of their work has been um, forgotten. That's why I like giving this talk is that in general, even astronomers don't know who Wilhelmina Fleming and Antonia Mari are. Um, Annie Jump Cannon, Henrietta Levitt, and Cecilia Payne are still very much known. I like to think they'd be proud of us, that they'd be happy for how far women in the field have come. And they'd be amazed at all of the things that we have found out about stars and how they work. Um, I think there are, um, Annie, Jump, Annie Jump Cannon was actually a suffragette. She worked to fight for uh, votes for women in the United States before um, our 19th Amendment was passed in 1920. Um, so I think that she would be, you know, marching right alongside us now um, for the issues that we're, deal that we're, that we're facing today. I, don't, it's, it's, I, I hope they'd be proud of us. I hope they'd be happy with the progress that um, has been made for women in the field, and I think they would probably want there to be even more. Can we use transits to detect stars? We, um, we actually can. If you have, so transits are if you have a binary star, and we're looking right into the, the binary. So if one planet if the planet comes across and it blocks some of the light from the star and you see the light from the star dip. And you can actually use it because sometimes if you look here, where's my HR diagram? Here we go. So if you look here, note that the faintest stars, what we call M dwarves, are one ten thousandth of the luminosity of our sun. And so these stars would be incredibly faint. So we might be able to see the other star, but we might not see the companion. And so in that case, we would see the same kind of dip and they could be used to detect the presence of a companion star, but only if you have a binary system and it's the exact same principle of a planet orbiting that star where you're seeing it by the dip in the light. So the Milky Way is made up is a disk, is a disk of stars with a central bulge. Most of it is stars. We have spiral arms. Let me see if I can, I actually have a great image of the Milky Way. If you give me a second, I can actually pull up an image of the Milky Way. I just have to get open one of my other presentations. 
So the Milky Way is a spiral galaxy. It looks sort of like a pinwheel. There's a central bulge and then arms that come out and spiral around. Most of the Milky Way is made up of stars. There's about 100 billion stars in our Milky Way galaxy. And, but it's also, there's also a certain amount of dust and gas. We have a supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy that is about three, that is about three million times the mass of our sun. But it's, it's about a hundred billion stars and a lot of gas and dust. And I have for my intro to astronomy class that I teach, I actually have a image, here we go. I actually have an image of the Milky Way. Here we go. So this is not an image of our Milky Way. I just want to clarify that here. This is not an image of our Milky Way galaxy. This is an artist's conception, but it is an astronomer at Caltech that did this. And this is based off of observational data. So this is a disk of the galaxy. It's sort of, it's, it's a very thin disk of stars. And in these spiral arms, the gas and the dust piles up and forms new stars. And then you have older stars in the center in the bulge here. And our sun is out here. We're kind of in the suburbs. We're in the outskirt. We're sort of out in the outskirts here. And, it, and the galaxy is, takes us about 250 million years to go around the whole thing. And something that's kind of cool to think about is when the dinosaurs existed, they were on the other, we were on the other side of the galaxy. So the dinosaurs literally existed on the other side of the galaxy because they, they were alive on earth about a hundred million years ago. And the whole galaxy is a disc and it's so wide that it takes light about a hundred thousand years to cross the entire disc. These are really, really great questions, by the way. I actually haven't had to think about what would the Harvard computers think, to, think of us today. That's actually not something that I've actually thought about before. Uh, Dr. Mia, I'm yes. Alosha from sixth grade. Uh, I want to ask you a question. How does the James Webb telescope work? The James Webb telescope works the same way that most telescopes work. You have a mirror and the light comes and it hits the mirror. And then it's focused into a second into a second mirror that we call the secondary. So this is the primary that's the big mirror and then you have a secondary. And then the secondary sends light to instruments that are behind the primary mirror here. What's really important, what's really sort of different about the James Webb is that it doesn't observe light in the visible part of the spectrum, which is what our eyes can see. It actually is designed to look at light in the near infrared. So in the part of the spectrum that you would think of as heat. So what you think of as heat is actually infrared radiation. And because of that, we have to keep the telescope incredibly, incredibly cold. So that's why it's at L2, which is a million miles away. In fact, it just got there on Monday. And it has a shield, a sun shield, that has these five incredibly thin layers. And one of the coolest things about that sun shield isn't actually what it does or how much it's able to cool down the telescope, but that the people who actually built it are got their start in fashion, actually doing fashion design. They actually sewed the sun shield. And it's five layers. And on the layer that points towards the sun right now, it's about 55 degrees. I'm trying to think. It's 13 Celsius on the side by the sun. And by the time you get to the telescope, once that things are fully cooled down, because it's still cooling off right now, it's actually only going to be 50 Kelvin. So it's actually going to be negative 220 degrees Celsius. And there is an awesome website that NASA is running. Uh, just a second, let me pull it up. There is an awesome website that NASA is running where you can actually track 
the James Webb Space Telescope. Let me go to the track web. And I'll put this in the chat if any of you want to see it. And then I'll actually share my screen. So this is the website. So this is where is web, basically. So you can see that it's made it to the L2 Lagrange point. So this is the Earth. This is the sun. This is the Earth and the moon. That we'd be in trouble if that was the sun. This is the, um, the moon. And this is how far out web is. So web is five times the distance to the moon right now. And you can see that on the hot side, let me just a second, we're going to go to metric here. Um, so on the hot side of the telescope, things are 13 Celsius, which is a perfectly acceptable temperature. But on the cool side of the telescope, it's negative 200 Celsius, which, Kel which um, Kelvin is, the zero point of Kelvin is absolute zero. So that's about 200, negative 273 Celsius. And we actually need to cool it down still further before we can actually begin to turn the instruments on. But that's basically how it works is that the light, this is a meter, this is a mirror that's 6.5 meters across. There are 18 individual segments that we move sometimes by less by one ten thousandth the width of a human hair to focus the telescope so that we can take these those beautiful, beautiful, beautiful images. So the light comes in from a distant star or a galaxy and then focuses up to this secondary, this mirror here, and then it sends the light in to all the instruments that are behind the telescope. And that's how it works. This is the sun shield. It's five layers, each layer progressively reflecting more and more light back to keep the telescope cool. It's completely passive, which means it can last however long the telescope lasts. So right now we have 20 years with this telescope, which is about 10 more than we were expecting. And this shield is the size of a tennis court. So it's huge. I don't know, I'm trying to think of something that is equivalent to the size of a tennis court. I'm thinking about the size of a tennis court, but this is, and it's incredibly thin. It's these five very thin layers. So that's how web works. Fundamentally, it works the same as any other telescope in the optical or the near or the infrared. It's just that it is, the most powerful telescope we have ever built. And it's, sorry, I have a, my cat is currently demanding breakfast. Um, and the, and so that's basically how it works. Um, it's, I personally, I'm incredibly excited. I have time, my, my collaborators and I actually, it's a woman led collaboration, completely woman led collaboration have 75 hours on time to look at the formation of galaxies halfway back to the Big Bang. So we're incredibly, incredibly excited when we start to get um, actual data and images from the telescope. What part of, that is a phenomenal question. I am not the best person to answer that because I do theory. So I spend a lot of time on computers. I think you'd want to do physics and you would want to also get as much expertise in engineering as you can possibly get. A lot of the people that built James Webb are actually engineers. They are aerospace engineers. They have, they have engineering training rather than actually astrophysics training. So that, so that would be, you know, it's, you still need the background in math. You still need the background in computers because everything is, is everything at this point, you need some sort of computers you need, and you still need the physics because engineering, you still have to take a huge amount of physics, but you would want to almost go more towards the engineering side of things than the actual sort of theoretical physics side of things. So that the, most of the people that built this are, are engineers. And what's been really incredible is actually the, the, one of the lead engineers on the telescope, her name is Amy. So it's been really cool watching all the broadcasts and everything. And a lot of the, the people that are running these different components of the telescope are women, which has been really cool. 
but yeah, it's, you need engineering, you need, that's more of an engineering, an engineering side of things, like a practical building of things. Not a problem. Like I said, I have friends who do this, like they literally build telescopes and they would know far better than I do. Some of them do for the record have astronomy degrees, like they have physics and astronomy degrees and then they picked up the engineering that they needed. But if you want to work on something, the scale, like work on something that's like the scale of the James Webb or the Hubble, that th those are actually engineers actually built it. Um, astronomers helped design it and they did a lot of the work for it. But if you actually want to be the one in the clean room, a lot of the people that were in there were actually engineers. But mostly, yes? Uh, Dr. Mia, I have another question. Go right ahead. What is the black hole event horizon? The black hole event horizon is a place, that's a phenomenal question. The black hole event horizon isn't, for the record, a physical thing. It's not something you can punch through or, or go anywhere. It's actually a theoretical line. And what it actually is, is it's the point where the, the, so you have, the reason we call it a black hole is because it's so dense that the velocity that you would need to escape the black hole is greater than the speed of light. And because nothing in the universe can go faster than light, it means nothing can escape. So when you have, so you basically have, here's your black hole, light can't escape from it. But the further away you get from the black hole, the slower and slower you would need to go in order to escape it. And the event horizon is the point where the, 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 the speed you would need to escape from the black hole is equal to the speed of light. And the more massive your black hole is, the further out that event horizon is. But it's actually not a physical barrier. It's often portrayed in sort of science fiction as oh, it's a physical barrier. It's not a physical barrier. It's just this point where once you go inside of that line, even light isn't going to be fast enough to escape the gravity of the black hole. Absolutely, yes. There is a, an aerospace engineer is actually the, the, the colloquial term for them in the United States is a rocket scientist. So absolutely engineers can build airplanes and rockets. And absolutely. In fact, that is, that is the, in general, they do not let astronomers near some of that stuff. We, we are not the people who build the rockets. We just use them to do amazing things. but that is aerospace. That's aerospace for rockets and aeronautical engineering for planes. And I actually have two awesome friends, uh, Jeff and, er and Amy, who are actually aeronautical engineers here in Texas. What are some streams in physics and astronomy that may have big demand 10 to 20 years from now? I think one of the big ones is this concept of something I mentioned in the talk, which is big data. We're about to have huge, huge surveys that are coming down. And these, abs these surveys are gonna produce terabytes of data. So a terabyte is about a terabyte is a giga gigabyte, basically. And they're going to be producing terabytes of data a day, like literally a night. They're going to be producing terabytes of data. And we have to figure out a way to go through all of this data in a way that actually gets the science out. And that isn't something you can do by hand. As much as we joke about you know, having an undergrad look at it, it really is something that has to be done using things like machine learning. 
So that's going to be one of the big ones is that we're going to have to figure out the challenge of how do you actually get science out of these massive data sets. And so that really that really is going to require a level of computer skills and coding skills that a lot of sort of older astronomers right now don't have. But that's one of the big ones that's going to be coming. It's really hard to know. And part of that reason is that we just launched the James, we just launched the Webb Space Telescope. And one of the things that we've learned is that whenever we launch a tool, a new tool that is as powerful as Webb is, there's always going to be something we see that isn't expected, that we didn't ever dream we would actually detect. And that shifts our understanding of the universe and the paradigm and our, and our understanding of everything going on quite a bit. And so given that in the given that we now have this incredibly powerful telescope that is up there, I would say that it's hard to know as far as like what are going to be the big questions in 10 or 20 years. I could guess based on now, I could guess based on my knowledge now. Um, I think still what, hap what happens in that first billion years after the Big Bang, just because it's so hard to see with telescopes. Um, exoplanets, the study of planets around other stars is going to continue to be incredibly important. And we have some new sort of things coming on. The question of how do we deal with date this, these massive data sets? How do you do science out of these massive data sets? I think are gonna be the, those are kind of the ones that I can see coming. But then again, in two years, James Webb could make an observation that completely shifts that and sends the focus of astronomy off in a different direction. And that could happen two years. So 10 or 20 years from now, I think you're gonna see a lot more computer work. You're gonna see a much larger emphasis on needing to code and code well. But other than that, it's I it's hard to say because we're about we're about to open up a new set of eyes on the universe and we're going to see something we don't expect. I promise you that. And just so all of you know, I would love to stay here and answer questions, but I unfortunately have a meeting that is in about um, 20 minutes. So I can answer questions for about another 10 minutes, but then I actually do need to go. Could the big crunch have happened before the big bang? Like, is there proof of the big crunch? Well, the big crunch is if there's enough matter in the universe to stop the expansion and turn it around and then it crunches back together again. And the answer is that we know we can we know we can know nothing before the big bang. Like before the point of the big bang, there's literally no way of knowing. It's interesting to potentially speculate, but there's that we have no way of we have no knowledge, basically. We actually believe now that the universe, we actually have found, and this is something that, remember I mentioned that the leave it law is this critical step of the distance ladder. And we use something called parallax for the nearby stars. The leave it law gets us to the nearby galaxies. And then we use um, these incredibly powerful standard candles called type 1a supernovae to actually get to the edge of the universe. And using those type 1a supernovae, Right, built on the Leave It Law, we've used these type 1a supernovae to actually find out that rather than slowing down, the expansion of our universe is actually accelerating. So we're at, there's not actually going to be a big crunch. We're just going to keep accelerating outward forever. But if was there a big crunch before the current Big Bang that set it off? There might have been, but it's literally something that is unknowable. There's no way to probe the physics of what was going on before the Big Bang with any kind of observation. Mm -hmm. 
No problem. It was a great question. Dr. Mia, I actually have a lot of questions. Now, in 2005, the Casino Space Probe identified enormous plumes of vapor that was going into outer space. Scientists suspect it's a giant geyser from Enceladus's oceans. So there are similar things on Earth. Underwater hydrothermal vents, well, if you're wondering what they are, they're actually underwater volcanoes of a sort. Instead of producing magma, they produce boiling hot, black smoky water. Now let's go back to the question. So it also produces the building blocks of life, such as methane. So I've been wondering if this can be possible on Jupiter's moon, Europa, and Enceladus. It absolutely could be. One of we have seen, we've also seen um, components when we look into space, we see these building blocks actually in space, in nebula. Um, it abs the discovery around Enceladus, these are jets that shot out from Saturn's moon Enceladus. And when they were found, it was shocking, like completely, oh my God, there's organic material in these. This is incredible. And the answer seems to be that what we're finding is that the building blocks of life are everywhere. And so the potential for life existing on worlds, even other worlds in our own solar system is, it, is, is very, very possible. However, there is a difference between most of that life would be microbial. It would be small bacteria or microbes if it formed at all. And then, and so there's a difference between sort of microbial life and then complex life, sort of multicellular life and then intelligent life. And um, that, and so that's the difference. But one of the most incredible things about that discovery was that these, these building blocks are absolutely everywhere. And I actually want to, I, and since I have to go, unfortunately, in five minutes, um, I just want to answer two of the questions in the chat. So what should we study other than our degree become, to become an astrophysicist like you? Um, honestly, it's really just read everything you can. Um, you know, it's the physics, the math, the computer science, read articles on astronomy. Um, one of the incredible things that you have that I didn't is the internet. Um, when I was sort of come, when I was um, 12 and 13 years old, the internet was in its absolute infancy and you didn't have access to all this stuff. If I wanted to get an article, I had to actually have a physical magazine or a physical book that I read but read absolutely everything. Go out and literally look up at the sky. There's this um, phenomenal poem by Walt Whitman um, that talks about the learned astronomer. And then you look up and gaze in wonder at the sky, you know, occasionally look up, which I know is an odd thing to say, but look up, you know, it, um, and absolutely. I gave um, Sachi, who is my grad student, I have, she has my email. And I had her give that to your teacher. So you feel free to send me an email if you have any other questions. Um, but the other thing for astrophysics is as you're going up through your schooling, 
if at all possible, take some random classes. Um, not don't focus so much on astronomy and physics that you don't also learn about literature or theater or art. Because I have found that those classes that I took actually have ended up being almost as valuable as the technical courses that I took as I moved up through my degree. And can we fly around the world by our own in a plane? Not without refueling currently, but yes, I think we're getting there. I think the longest flights are Perth to London, I think is one of the longest flights. And I, so I have given, um, I, I believe I told um, Sachi to pass on my email address. And if any of you have any other questions, um, you can send me an email and I will put that in, I will put my email in the chat. So you can send me an email and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much for having me. I absolutely, I love talking about the women of Harvard. It's not a boy's day, it is not a girl's day, it is everyone's day. It is about where we are and where we are going. A very good morning and good evening to all of you. Today's lecture has given us deep insights and dedication for our future life. For that, first and foremost, I would like to thank our special guest speaker, Dr. Bian Borville, Professor, Assistant Professor of Astronomy at Texas Christian University, USA who despite her busy schedule has found time to enlighten us with her knowledge. And I express my heartfelt gratitude to Ms. Sachitra Virasurya who helped in organizing this lecture. Also, I must mention our Madam Principal, Mrs. Nelumbi Alvis and Vice Principals, Mrs. Asha Vidyanapathirana and Mrs. Anusha Prasudi for giving us this opportunity and guiding us towards knowledge to help us achieve more. And I would also like to acknowledge my sincere words to our teacher, Mrs. Gayatri De Silva, for acting as the energy source of us. Last but not least, I thank all the distinguished invitees present here, accepting our invitation. I thank the members of the society for advising interest in covering the event and all good hearts who work behind the scenes. Finally, I leave you all the inspiring quote by Marie Curie. We must have perseverance and above all, confidence in ourselves. We must believe that we are gifted for something and that this must be attained. Thank you.